Hello from London. My name is Nick Skudamore and I am a film uh, historian, lecturer in London mostly uh, at the British Film Institute, uh, also London University and um, in the past I've uh, presented at Fordham and perhaps that's why Professor Sicker thought it would be uh, a nice idea if I spoke to you today about Battle for Algiers. Um, so let me welcome you to a truly insurrectional film. Art is always born out of a sp specific historical moment and great art is expressive of both that moment and an aspiration to influence the future. And I want to suggest to you today that Battle for Algiers, directed by Guillermo Pontecorvo in 1966, is truly a great piece of cinematic art. The film Battle for Algiers has rarely left any viewer unmoved, even 50 plus years after its original making. Indeed, I find that with my students, when I ask them to rank all the films that they've seen on a course with me, um, that may be 15 or 20 titles, it's quite rare that Battle of Algiers isn't somewhere in the top five. Um, I'm going to assume that you've already watched the film in its entirety before coming to this PowerPoint presentation, but if that is not the case, then perhaps this presentation will provoke you to watch the entire film as soon as possible. Um, I shall offer background commentary, historical background, and also draw your attention uh, through uh, six movie clips um, from the film, which I think merit particular attention, clips of four to six minutes each, um, in which uh, and then I will want to draw out particular examples from that. Um, I will also suggest questions for you to think about as you're watching the clip and then try to suggest, try to anticipate what uh, you might have given uh, as an answer to that. So let's get started. Here's a good starting point. From an interview with Franco Salinas, scriptwriter, to be found in the introduction to the published screenplay for Battle of Algiers, which is available in the Fordham Library. Quote, question, can we assume that you had a didactic, a didactic intention whilst preparing the movie? Franco Salinas, yes, sure. I was intrigued by the mechanism of the struggle against colonialism, and in particular by its manifestation in Algeria through tactics of urban guerrilla warfare. I meant to explore those tactics, the details of their function, by taking them apart from within to show how the mechanisms work. You could say that our goal was not guerrilla for the sake of spectacle, but the use of spectacle to teach the guerrilla." Unquote. Today, my own methodology shall be a little less incendiary. Let's begin with some historical background. Since 1830, Algeria, a country on the coast of North Africa, had been a colony of France. In 1962, following a brutal war of independence, Algeria as a nation finally achieved full independence from France. Earlier, from about 1954 to 1970, during this revolutionary period, before the 1962 settlement, Algiers, the capital city, became a sort of cultural crossroads where thinkers and activists from all over what you would nowadays call the Global South met and theorised revolution. Amongst very many others, Franz Fanon, Ahmed Ben Bella, Gamil Abdel Nasser, Fidel Castro, Patrice Lamomba, Oliver Tambo, whom with Nelson Mandela and others was founder of the ANC of South Africa, all these passed through Algiers. These men were seeking to provoke great political change within their different countries, usually beginning with bringing to an end what they described as the colonial occupation of their home nations. Many activists and radical thinkers visited from the USA also, among them Stokely Carmichael, Malcolm X, Dr. Timothy Leary, Kathleen and Eldridge Cleaver, 
so this was a time for much internationalist and leftist radical thinking. In 1963, the newly established Algerian government wanted to tell the story of their successful revolution on film, and so sought out a suitable director and writer for what would be their first grand national film project. Guillo Pontecorvo was a successful film director who had an impeccable leftist political history. He had led an Italian underground resistance team against the Nazis in Northern Italy during World War II. Pontecorvo was a committed member of the Italian Communist Party and had already in 1960 directed an effective drama called Capo, set in a Polish concentration camp. It's a grim tale of moral corruption and betrayal amongst the prisoner victims of the camp. So Gilo Pontecorvo appeared to the Algerians to be definitely the right man to prepare and then present a revolutionary film of ordinary lives transformed by radical times. Battle for Algiers is notable for not using professional actors and for its location filming and use of natural light and a minimum of special effects. However, even in 1966, this strategic methodology was not without precedent in recent film history. In Italy, during the period of the Second World War, the censors of the fascist government had mainly approved only film scripts of comforting comic romance. With the fall of European fascism in 1945, there had emerged a new cinema style that would come to be described as Italian neorealism. Immediately post-war, these new films, such as these two examples here, by directors like Roberto Rossellini and Vittorio De Sica, were intended as deliberate contrasts with the films permitted by the collapsed former regime. Rome, Open City, by Roberto Rossellini, Italy 1945, is a tale of resistance to the Nazi occupiers filmed in the streets of Rome itself, even as the actual war was concluding along Italy's northern borders. Bicycle Thieves, by Vittorio De Sica, Italy 1948, is set in the world of the economically excluded who inhabit Rome's slums. It's a tale of a man who struggles desperately to recover a stolen bicycle so that he may keep his job and thereby feed his family and thus live with dignity. These new neorealist films, the two posters here represent only a pair of the most famous, were made with the intent to entertain, certainly, but also to express the urgent need for social change, for investment in infrastructure and education, for the alleviation of much systemic poverty. Neorealist films like these were also noted, in many cases, for being cast largely with unknown actors and being set in very unglamorous and so immediately recognisable domestic and social situations, and with narrative endings that tended to promote thoughtfulness over reassurance. Getting a script funded so that it can become a film is rarely easy. Indeed, almost all working filmmakers spend 90% of their time trying to raise funds for film scripts they are interested in translating to the screen. This problem is exacerbated when trying to raise money for a film about a serious political issue. Backers are more likely to invest if a big-name star can be attached to a potential script. Franco Salinas' first idea was the American actor Paul Newman. Newman, at this early draft stage, was to play a charming and stylish French journalist who travels from Vietnam, a former colonial interest of France, remember, to learn of the revolutionary intentions of the Algerian patriots and who would ultimately come to find common cause with them and in his writing and increasing activism promote the justice of the Algerian cause to the wider world, etc. etc. You will recognise this plot arc from your own store of recollected film viewings. This is the one in which a personable Westerner grows towards moral wisdom as she or he becomes engaged in some version of an actual real-world issue in a faraway part of the globe. Lots of films, some of them long remembered with approval, follow this narrative pattern. Films like Blood Diamond, Hotel Rwanda, The Year of Living Dangerously, Cry Freedom, Silence, even Warner Brothers' Casablanca all follow this paradigm. The problem with this story arc that rises particularly for the that sorry that arises particularly for the politically minded filmmaker 
is that the script will very often become about the moral enlightenment of the generous-hearted Western protagonist, while the local people, for whom this is a real war or other social convulsion, are very likely to be reduced to a decorative and exotic backdrop within a well-told tale. In effect, no matter how dramatically powerful such a film may be, it may well struggle in any attempt to provoke a European or American audience to embrace the idea of an actual political revolution. So anchoring the film of Algeria's successful revolution around a charming Western star was decided against. Therefore, director Gilopoldo Curva chose instead to draw on the example of Italian neorealism by such means as carefully coaching appropriate social actors for his proposed new film about the Algerian revolution. A social actor is a non-professional actor who is guided to present on screen a version of a person very like themselves working at a job and living a narrative life very like the life they live off the screen. This means that, in the case of Battle of Algiers especially, almost everyone in the film had effectively been present during the very recent historical events alluded to. In addition, the events staged are often filmed with a handheld camera on locations in the city of Algiers and the Arabic Kasbah district, very close to where so many familiar events have actually happened. Ponte Corvo admits, however, that the crowd scenes have to be very carefully choreographed to achieve their memorable dramatic impact of apparently spontaneous behaviour. Thus, Brahim Hagig, an illiterate road render, but with the right face, was cast as Ali La Pointe. Sadly, despite his amazing screen presence in this film, he had only a very brief film career. Yafar is the revolutionary leader who guides Ali La Pointe's activism. He is played by Yosef Saadi, who had been an active radical and was now an Algerian politician here playing a version of his earlier self. Fusa El Kadar, who plays Halima, was also a former revolutionary. One important exception to the social act casting was Jean Martin, who plays Colonel Mathieu, the leader of the French paratroopers. He was a professional actor, but known mainly for the French stage. So the sense of dramatic immediacy, the docudrama fiction effect, if you will, was a very carefully prepared for and so designed in from the very first principles of this film's presentation. So it's time to look at our first film clip. The first section I'd like to draw your attention to is the film's opening six minutes. Time code says 51 seconds in because uh, it actually begins after um, nearly a minute's worth of silent pre-title sequences. And ends, uh, this clip uh, ends at 6 minutes 44 seconds uh, with a, a huddle of figures in a dark space before dissolving to an exterior of the city of Algiers. Here are two questions for you to think about while watching this clip. Do you recognize any names in these film title credits that you are about to watch? A name that you may have noticed on other films elsewhere. And also, second question, look out for the first close-up. What does this tell us about the film that is just beginning? Alors, tu pouvais pas te décider sans faire tant d'histoire, ça aurait été mieux pour toi. Il a finalement craché le morceau. Donne-lui du café. Allons, ne t'inquiète pas, va. Allez, bois un coup, ça va te remettre. Allez, t'es pas de bile, mon vieux, tiens. On dirait que oui, 3 rue des Abderam. Il faut l'habiller. Allons, du cran. C'est fini maintenant, il ne peut plus rien t'arriver, encore un petit effort. Est-ce que tu peux te tenir debout Lâchez-le. 
Tiens, mets ça. Ça t'ira très bien. Maintenant, on va aller à la casbah et avec ça, ils ne pourront pas te reconnaître. Tu as compris Tu vas nous indiquer l'endroit où se cache Ali la pointe. Après, tu seras libre. Donnez-lui une casquette et habillez-le. Intégration. <rire> allons, allons, fais pas l'idiot, la gloire. Allons-y. Non Tu vas rester tranquille. Tu veux qu'on recommence Allons, fais pas le zouave. Un peu de courage. So, my first question to you while you watched that opening sequence was, question one, did you recognize any of the names on the main credits from any other movie you may have seen elsewhere? The answer I hope you offered is Ennio Morricone. He is the Italian master of movie scores, best remembered uh, for the music on the early Clint Eastwood, Sergiliani Spaghetti Westerns. But if you Google Morricone's name, you will find an impressively long list of movie credits long after that, and indeed some before, of which Battle of Algiers is one. The Battle of Algiers score, uh, scored for trumpet and electric guitars, uh, drums, uh, and Arabic drumming later on, and a snatch of Bach or two, was heard as very radical in 1966. My second question to you from the title sequence relates to this image. 
This is the Battle of Algiers' first close-up. We are presented with this poor man's shame and despair and bewilderment of what has just happened to him. He has been tortured and has revealed a crucial street address. As we will later learn, this old man is not a radical, just an unfortunate who is in the wrong place at the wrong time. The camera probes his misery and emphasises the helplessness of his situation. And here's another question. Can you remember what happened just, be just before this man had that French military cap mockingly placed upon his head? Answer, the young private had shouted ironically, Antigration, as he places the cap on his head. The subtitles offer, you're inducted, but a clearer translation might be something like integration, which was, of course, the goal of the French colonial administration, to make Algerians believe in themselves as French men and women. Notice that the commanding officer rebukes the private. Colonel Mathieu barks out, cut the clowning, Langway. This suggests that this film will make an attempt at even-handedness when presenting the film's political argument by which I do not mean that the film is unclear about its intentions. The film has a very clear point of view. After all, it was paid for by the Algerian government and the Italian Communist Party. But there is an attempt to present the colonial point of view, and that point of view is offered. Let's move on. This is where our first clip ended. Notice on the right, Ali Lapointe's blazing eyes. They are what marks him out as an actor. He vibrates with righteous rage from his first appearance. Ali will be the representative ordinary Algerian whose personal history is to be emblematic of a collective revolutionary experience that is to be told through the film. These other apprehensive faces will also become very familiar to us as the movie moves forward. So, the actor on the left here is billed as Le Petit Omar and is played by Mohamed Ben Kassan. This delightfully expressive social actor seems to have no other credits. The little boy reads aloud to the large man. The illiterate Ali, radicalised in jail, here gets his first covert instructions as an aspiring revolutionary. He is instructed to find and shoot a French policeman who will be receiving counter-terrorist information from an Algerian cafe owner, a civilian informant. By arrangement, Ali meets his next contact in the street and receives a pistol from this woman's basket. Then, in full public view in the street, Ali shoots at the policeman. But the revolver is without bullets. Ali, amazed and horrified, knocks the cop to the ground and runs off as fast as he can. Ali is outraged. Have his new comrades immediately betrayed him? So his new boss, Yahar, explains, if Ali had in fact been a police plant, when he was first recruited to the revolution in jail, then he would never have been allowed by his counter-terrorist handlers to agree to shoot a policeman. Incidentally, the staging of this sequence reveals Pontecorvo's first clear indication that women will also have an active part to play in this political revolution. Yafar goes on to explain the political need to purge the Arab Kasbah district of undesirables, and you will recall that what follows after is the very troubling sequence of the old drunk being hounded and dragged down and kicked about by a gang of small mocking boys. This is soon followed by the sequence where Ali, now apparently operating as an enforcer for the revolutionaries, goes in search of a local drug dealer and pimp. When challenged by the pimp, Ali guns him down in the street. The staging and editing of this sequence is interesting in a number of ways, but I will refer just to Ali's murder of the pimp by saying the blazing gun and the body being hit by bullets within the same frame is very explicit. Before 1967, such a staging was vanishingly rare in English or American film, 
Back then, censors would not have permitted such a presentation. First the gun barrel sprouting flame and the loud noise, and then a cut to a body falling. Today, such staging of an action is unremarkable. Back in 1966, this was stunning. Let's go to the second film clip. This is the wedding ceremony. It's a fairly short sequence, but an important one. Here are a couple of questions for you to think about while you study this sequence. Question one, what dramatic purpose does this next sequence serve? Question two, try to remember the camera movement at the end of this sequence clue. I'm referring to the first exterior shot after we leave the ceremony proper. Why frame the shot in this particular manner? انتو مع السوق قدام الباب السلام عليكم اهلا بكم كاش راكم صاحيتو كاش راك الشيخ لاباس لاباس اتفضلوا يا رب انصر المجاهدين يا رب نجعل لنا النصر عن قريب امين امين تفضلوا تفضلوا والان نقوموا بسرعه بالقضيه اللي على بالكم منها وراكم عارفين علاش نتمناو اللي يجي نهار ونحتفلوا بعد الزفاف ان شاء الله في بسط وانشراح ما تنساوش اللي رانا في حرب ضد الاستعمار اللي بجنود قويه حتى واستعمر بلادنا مده 130 سنه وهذا الشيء اللي لازم السلطه الثوريه تاخذ قرارات تتعلق بحياه المدنيه نتاع الشعب الجزائري وبهذا الزواج رانا قمنا بواجب وهو واجب حربي والان محمود وفاتحه الزوج وزوجة ماذا بهم يتقدموا امضي من فضلك بارك الله فيك وانت يا الان غايه باسم الجبهه وجيش التحرير نقدم لكم تهانينا الحاره تفضلوا تفضلوا سبحان ربك سبحان ربك رب العزه فيك رب العزه فيك اما يصفون اما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله رب العالمين رب العزه فيك رب العزه فيك So the questions I put to you before the wedding clip were, one, what dramatic purpose did this wedding sequence serve? And an answer I would suggest is the wedding sequence is presented here in deliberate contrast to the rather gangsterish series of assassinations that precedes it. The narrative device and so political message here is to suggest that social normalcy can also exist in a revolutionary moment. The presiding officer of the ceremony um, offers a deliberately political commentary on the political importance of this private family occasion, a point rather soberly underlined when the officer opens his briefcase to draw out the necessary documents and we catch a glimpse of a large automatic pistol barely hidden within it. What is very important here is the formality of the event the civic orderliness, the solemnity of expression on all faces, the rather endearing youth and charm of the attractive couple. All these present a brief moment of optimistic normalcy in the midst of a civil war. Question two from the wedding sequence. 
This was about the camera movement at the end of the wedding sequence. I asked why frame was shot in this particular manner. If you remember, the camera tilts up from the internal courtyard where the wedding is happening to show us the viewing neighbours above and then, on a cut, moves right out over a view of the whole city and as the prayer music rises on the soundtrack, tilts up slightly. We see people grouped on the adjoining flat rooftops, their hands in an attitude of prayer, their faces positive of expression. What is evoked here is the possibility of a stable and benign future, a glimpse of the better world the revolution hopes to bring into being for all Algeria. Later in the film, the camera will offer a significantly contrasting shot. After the respite of the wedding, we return immediately to the brutal realities of urban guerrilla warfare. Now begins the armed assaults on policemen, often shot in the back. These attacks are shown as happening with increasing frequency. The other object for the Algerian rebels is to acquire weapons. I have a question for you. Do you recall the music track during this grim sequence? What about it? Morricone presents us with a thunderous and metallic soundtrack, at first of single notes and then chords on an electric bass guitar, with drums and trumpets and piano building as the pace of the editing accelerates. This adds depth and weight to the shocking sequence. The authorities respond with curfews and restrictions of public movement, specifically the Arab district of the Kasbah that lies above the European city is barricaded off. The police detective, in his office at night, feels his men are not being supported by the chain of command. He determines to take direct action, therefore. So let's have a look at our third film clip now. Notice how this sequence begins, or to put it uh, more directly as a question, where are we? What sort of social event has been happening here? A second question again refers to camera movement. What does the camera do at the end of this sequence? Bonsoir, Mama. Mais que font-ils encore debout à cette heure-ci Bernadette. Ils vont se coucher tout de suite, madame. Bernadette. Bernadette. Oui Tu sais, on va s'en aller, nous aussi. Oh, mais vous avez le temps. Est-ce que, que vous pouvez être embêtant avec votre oh, chère Vous ne voulez pas nous faire ici, non Votre petit frère m'aurait de me reposer. Vous voulez vraiment partir Nous n'aurons pas de temps. Vous allez prendre encore un verre avant de partir. Oui, moi, je prendrai bien encore un verre. Non, non, désolé, nous sommes en retard. On nous a demain. Allons, allons. Au revoir, Robert. Au revoir, tout le monde. Merci. Allez, les gars, dépêchez-vous un peu. Au revoir, Lucien. Et ne retenez pas Henri trop tard. Au revoir, Jeannot. Au revoir. Au revoir. Monte derrière. Bonsoir, messieurs. Bonsoir. Est-ce qu'on peut passer Trop tard. Le couvre-feu a déjà commencé. Laissez passer. Il est avec moi. Bien, monsieur le commissaire. Vous pouvez passer. Merci. Vas-y, Henri.
So, may I suggest some answers to the questions posed earlier. Question one, as the sequence opens, what has been happening? The answer is the policemen and their wives have been enjoying an evening meal together out of doors in a large garden. The young children say goodnight and are sent off to bed with Fatima, the nanny. Then, after curfew, in the Kasbah, these same family men plant their bomb, which detonates to horrific effect. Second question was about camera movement. Why frame the shot this way? And I think I would want to suggest an answer something like this. As the, uh, at the moment of explosion, the camera tilts down into the gaping hole where the house had been. So this shot contrasts with the up tilt at the end of the wedding sequences and intended to do so. Of course, this is the wrong house. This is where the elderly road repairman lived. The one that we saw earlier being shouted at by the crowd above him from their balconies as they angrily denounced him to the police in the streets below. Here, in this sequence suggested by the slide here, the camera now pans across the crowd of people doing their desperate best to recover bodies and rescue whomever they can. The music is now a solemn dirge. So here we come to clip number four. The insurgency now increases in aggression. Just before this next clip coming up, you may remember we see these three women change their clothes and convert their appearance into a more European or Western style. As they do this, there is furious North African style drumming on the music track as they prepare now for the atrocities that are to come. Here's an important question for you to consider as you study this distressing sequence coming up. How are the Europeans presented in this upcoming sequence?
hasta mañana. Rebeca, no te retardes. Mi vida, hasta mañana. Rebeca, espero que tú no vas a olvidar. Attention, attention. Le vol 432 en direction de Paris décollera avec un retard de 20 minutes. Attention, attention. Le vol 432 en direction de Paris décollera avec un retard de 20 minutes. Oui, oui, on sait ce que je m'en rappelle. Vous voulez un autre martini C'est qu'à mal donné. Je le suis. Tu comprends Moi, je l'aimerais aller en Italie. Vous dites que c'est bien. Ma femme n'aime pas l'Espagne. Elle dit qu'on commence plus vite en Italie. Bitterly horrific sequence. An answer to the question I put to you about representation of the Europeans in that sequence might be answered with a question, so to speak. Something like, did you notice how the French had been particularized in that last sequence? For example, the polite French businessman who offers mild pleasantries to the woman who comes into the bar with her bag and sits at the bar, the child licking an ice cream, the teenagers dancing near the jukebox and so on. These are innocents presented very differently to the sneering racist mob that had shouted at the road mender in the earlier sequence. The editing and the music are propulsive here our discomfort as an audience member, I'm sorry, as audience members, is magnified here, for we know what is to happen to these people that we are watching, as do the bombers who are also watching and share an equal foreknowledge with us. This amplifies an implied complicity in us and thus adds to our sense of horror at what is about to befall. And there is an elegant lacuna here. We are vividly aware that there are three bombs to be planted, but we only see two catastrophes. The third explosion occurs off screen. We hear it, as do the rescuers and first responders, as they look off screen right. Ponte Corvo knows he has made his point, and 
he has shown the ruthlessness that even the most ordinary people are capable of if sufficiently assured of their moral authority. The story now turns. After the triple bombings, the French authorities in Paris decide to send in one of their crack military units, the paratroopers. They are led by Colonel Mathieu. You may possibly remember him from a few moments at the very, very beginning of the film. As Colonel Mathieu leads a parade of the French state's military might, his achievements are read off to us by a stentorian voiceover. We are meant to understand that this man represents a formidable adversary to the Algerian FLN. But this effect is, if not quite undermined, at least qualified when we recollect that Ali La Pointe was also introduced and his career as a petty criminal read out to us in exactly the same manner at the scene of his arrest in the street nearer the beginning of the film. However, we need be in no doubt of the French state's military determination to win this war against terrorists. Soon, Colonel Mathieu, a counterinsurgency expert, explains to his men exactly how a terror cell is formed and how it is structurally linked to the team who command it. This reminds us that many revolutionary groups are said to have valued Battle of Algiers, Black Panthers, the PLO, the IRA, have used this film as a recruiting text and as a text of instruction, and I have been reliably informed that the film has also been used by the Israeli Defence Force as a training film for its soldiers during their national service. Perhaps most memorably, memorably my more recent research widely suggests that the Pentagon itself organised screenings of Battle of Algiers as part of its research and retraining response following the 9-11 atrocities. Colonel Mathieu also explains the futility of routine police checkpoints. It is precisely the terrorists who will have their papers in order so as to pass through. Also, the terrorists may very possibly be unthreatening in appearance, even appealing. Of course, from the, from the police surveillance footage Colonel Mathieu is screening for his troops, we recognise this smiling young woman who is here charming her way past a checkpoint. At this moment, we know more even than Colonel Mathieu. She is one of the three perpetrators from the shocking triple bombing earlier. The counter-argument to Colonel Mathieu's analysis is now presented as Yafar and his superior, Larbi Ben Mahidi, discuss strategies together, and then Ben Mahidi presents this programme for the revolution to Ali Lapointe and thus to ourselves. The two men who begin this next sequence are indeed social actors, Larbi Ben Mahidi and Yosif Sardi, were in fact, in actual fact, Algerian revolutionaries who had, by 1966, become politicians in the new Algerian government. Indeed, quite a few of the narrative events of this film are fictionalizations of events from Yosef Sardi's own personal story. If you seek out the DVD box set published by Criterion, you will find Mr. Sadi commenting on the film's narrative and political intentions on one of the supplementary discs. The question for you as you watch this next sequence is, how do scriptwriter Salinas and director Ponte Corvo have Ben Mahidi describe the political and revolutionary function of terrorism? هادو فقراء مساكين بالي الناس بالخدمة النظام قرر باش نستكلفو بهم ونضيفوهم في هاد التنمية نتاع الحراب عند شي حايلات وباش ما يقعدوش مرميين في الزنق واللي استعماريها لكم ولكن ما عرفش اللي يجيبوهم حتى لهنا راني متأسف ومتخيف علاش؟ خاطر هنا ذا الوقت يلزم أكثر حل من هنا ما عندكش ثقة فيهم؟ عندي لكن شكون يعرف؟ 
صحة أنت صاحب الأمر لا لو كنت أنا صاحب الأمر ده الوقت ما لكش هنا في العاصمة الواجب قبل كل شيء نحضر مليح لازم لك ترافق سي بن مهيدي حتى لدار السجور راك واجدي عليه وعلاش ما يرقدش هنا لا ما يبانش هنا روح معاه وراني نستناك حتى تولي واش تقول في هذه تعجبك هكذا كي تخلص الخدمه حد ما ينتبه لها تحب تجربها نجربوها من بعد ما عندناش الوقت سيب مهدي راني نبعث لك اتصال غدوة ان شاء الله طيب علي تجوز لقدام وما تنساش اقطع على جمع سفير هاي فرات ما كان حد اما لما نقدروا نعمل والو مده ثمان ايام واش ظهر لك في هذا الاضراب يا علي انا نظن ينجح نعم حتى انا كذلك الاضراب راه منظم مليح ولكن فرنسا ايش تعمل من غير شك تعمل مجهودها باش تكسره ما ينجحش لا تعمل اكثر على خاطر عطينا لها السبه باش تعمل اكثر راك فاهم وش حبيت نقول من غدوه الخدمه تسهل عليهم كل العمال كل التجار يوليو لهم عديان تاع الطحن ويتهموهم كيما يحبوا ومن بعد العسكر تهجم على الشعب فهمتوا وش حبيت نقول لك علي جعفر قال لي باللي راك ماكش موافق على هذا الاضراب نعم مانيش موافق وعلاش على خاطر قالوا لنا ما استعملوش السلاح مده 8 ايام تاع الاضراب اسمع لي ماهوش الارهاب اللي وصلنا باش نربحوا الحرب والا باش تنجح الثوره الارهاب لازم في الابتداء ولكن من بعد لابد الشعب كله يتحرك هذا هو الهدف تاعنا بهذا الاضراب الكبير يلزم تجنيد كل الجزائريين هم تعلي باش نوزن قوتنا باش نوريوها لوني نعم باش نوريوها لوني مانيش عارف اذا النتيجة تكون مليحة ولكن نعطيه فرصة لجمعية الامم باش توزن ارادة الشعب الجزائري اسمع لي يصعب للشعب باش يبدا الثورة ويصعب له بزاف باش يوصلها ويصعب له اكثر واكثر باش ينتصر ولكن من بعد بعد ما ننتصروا اللي يبداوا الصعوبات الكبيره خويا علي مازال عندنا واجب كبير ياك مازال ما عيدش لا So the answer to the question I set before that rather powerful night scene in which the two men theorizing revolution have their discussion at a balcony looking down into the courtyard below where uh, Ponte Corvo has arranged Algerians to as kind of representative figures of the very people whose lives are being uh, described and his, for whose intentions the revolution is being planned and executed. The answer to the question about the function of terrorism is Bin Mahidi says that terrorism is needed to initiate change but that people must believe in the revolution, must follow through in order for it to succeed. He has a rather nice aphorism about revolutions are, are very difficult to start, extremely difficult to sustain and almost impossible to win. Here yeah, is our final film clip. The general strike commanded by the FLN upon the population of Algeria as a whole, but in the city in particular, has provoked a large-scale military intervention and search and seizure. 
people are being aggressively coerced into going back to work. Soon after this comes the bombing at the racetrack with more dead civilians and more violent reprisals. Later the colonel speaks to the press on his own behalf and gives the rationale for the army's tactics, which he sums up as, we are soldiers, our duty is to win. Now comes the press conference uh, staged by Colonel Mathieu with Bin Mihadi, the FLN leader, apparently captured almost by chance by Colonel Mathieu's men uh, before an important audience of international journalists. Here are two questions for you to consider as you watch the sequence. Notice when the Colonel intervenes uh, to interrupt and then bring to a halt the press conference. Why does he do this? And the second question, what is Colonel Mathieu's final question to the journalists? Bon, allez, les photographes, terminé. Monsieur ben terminé. Ben ne trouvez-vous pas plutôt lâche d'utiliser les sacs et les couffins de vos femmes pour transporter vos bombes Ces bombes qui font tant de victimes innocentes. Et vous Ne vous semble-t-il pas bien plus lâche de larguer sur des villages sans défense vos bombes au napalm qui tuent mille fois plus d'innocents Évidemment, avec des avions, ça aurait été beaucoup plus commode pour nous. Donnez-nous vos bombardiers, monsieur, et on vous donnera le couffin. Monsieur Ben Hedy, in your opinion, does the FLN still have some chance of defeating the French army? Il demande, Monsieur Ben Midi, selon vous, le FLN a-t-il encore quelque chance de battre l'armée française? Selon moi, le FLN a beaucoup plus de chances de battre l'armée française que celle-ci n'en a d'arrêter le cours de l'histoire. Une déclaration du colonel Mathieu nous a appris que vous avez été arrêté par hasard. Pratiquement par erreur. Les parachutistes étaient en train de rechercher un personnage beaucoup moins important que vous-même. Pourriez-vous nous dire pour quelles raisons vous vous trouviez dans l'appartement de la rue de Bussy Je peux seulement vous dire qu'il eût mieux valu pour moi n'y avoir jamais mis les pieds. Cela suffit pour l'instant, messieurs. Il est tard et nous avons tous à travailler. C'est terminé le spectacle Oui, il est terminé. Avant qu'il ne produise un effet contraire. du ministre résident, M. Gorlin, a déclaré que l'arbi Ben Hidi s'est suicidé dans sa cellule en se pendant avec des lambeaux de sa chemise, dont il avait fait une corde, et qu'il avait ensuite attaché au Assez. barreau de la fenêtre. Or, à cause de l'intention déjà manifestée de s'évader à la première occasion, il avait été jugé nécessaire de tenir constamment le détenu Ben Hidi main et pieds liés. Selon vous, mon colonel, en de telles circonstances, un homme peut-il déchirer sa chemise, en faire une corde et l'attacher à un barreau de la fenêtre pour se pendre Cette question, vous devriez la poser au porte-parole du ministre. Ce n'est pas moi qui ai fait de telles déclarations. Pour ma part, je peux seulement vous dire que j'ai eu la possibilité d'apprécier la force morale, le courage, et la fidélité de Ben Midi en ses propres idéaux. Pour cela, sans oublier l'immense danger qu'il représentait, je me sens le devoir de rendre hommage à sa mémoire. Ah, Colonel Mathieu, on parle beaucoup en ces derniers temps, non seulement des succès obtenus par les parachutistes, 
mais aussi des méthodes qui seraient utilisées par eux. Pourriez-vous nous dire quelque chose à ce sujet Les succès dont vous parlez sont les résultats de ces méthodes. Les uns présupposent les autres et vice-versa. Excusez-moi, mon colonel. Il semble que, peut-être par excès de, de prudence, mes collègues continuent à poser des questions indirectes auxquelles vous ne pouvez répondre qu'allusivement. Je pense qu'il vaudrait mieux appeler les choses par leur vrai nom. Et si on veut tout dire, parlons de la torture. Compris. Et vous, vous ne posez aucune question Les questions ont déjà été posées. Je voudrais que les réponses soient plus précises, c'est tout. Essayons d'être précis. Le mot torture n'apparaît pas dans nos directives. Nous avons toujours parlé d'interrogatoire en tant que seule méthode valable pour une action de police contre une organisation clandestine. Le FLN, de son côté, demande à chacun de ses membres qu'en cas de capture, il conserve le silence pendant 24 heures. Après quoi, il peut parler. L'organisation a ainsi le temps nécessaire pour rendre inutilisable n'importe quel renseignement. Et nous quelle forme d'interrogatoire devrions-nous adopter Celui en usage dans la procédure civile qui, pour le moindre délit, dure des mois La légalité n'est pas toujours commode, mon colonel. Est-ce que celui qui fait exploser des bombes dans les lieux publics respecte la légalité Lorsque vous avez posé cette question à Ben Midi, souvenez-vous de ce qu'il a répondu. Non, messieurs, croyez-moi. C'est un cercle vicieux. Nous pourrions en parler des heures durant sans arriver à une conclusion. Car tel n'est pas le problème. Le problème est, le FLN veut nous chasser d'Algérie et nous, nous voulons y rester. Or maintenant, il me semble que même avec des nuances légères, vous êtes tous d'accord que nous devons y demeurer. Et lorsque la rébellion du FLN a éclaté, il n'y avait même pas de nuance. Tous les journaux, l'humanité compris, ont demandé qu'elle soit étouffée. Nous avons même été envoyés ici pour cela. Et nous, messieurs, nous ne sommes ni fous, ni sadiques. Ceux qui aujourd'hui nous appellent des fascistes, Feigne d'oublier la part importante que beaucoup d'entre nous ont pris dans la résistance. Ceux qui nous appellent nazis ne savent peut-être pas que certains d'entre nous ont survécu à Dachau et à Buchenwald. Nous sommes des soldats et nous avons le devoir de vaincre. Alors, pour être précis, à mon tour maintenant de poser la question. La France doit-elle rester en Algérie Si vous répondez encore oui, vous devez en accepter toutes les conséquences nécessaires. So, answers to the two questions. Why does the colonel intervene to break off the press conference? And the answer is, I think he senses that Ben Mahidi's answers are so well placed as to be winning uh, him political sympathy from at least some of these valuable international journalists. Um, and then, the, of course, this is... Uh, the successful propagandistic writing of Soninas, but it's a, an important point is being made. Question two, at the end of the press conference, after Ben uh, Mahidi has been taken from the room, um, having made his marvellous remark, uh, c'est fini le spectacle, uh, which might be translated as, so the show's over then, uh, he's taken away. Colonel Mathieu now puts a question to the assembled press. He says, um, the question, the question you have to answer, gentlemen, is should France remain in Algeria? If you answer yes, then you must accept also all the necessary consequences. And this leads into a very distressing sequence. Can you remember what comes up next? Um, and the answer is, of course, it's the torture sequence played with uh, solemn organ music uh, laid over it, as we see unspeakably cruel things being done to uh, alleged revolutionaries. So, here we are, almost at the end of this presentation. Um, I found this really rather wonderful Polish film poster uh, for the international release, The Battle of Algiers. And before we leave the film, I did want to at least refer briefly to its critical reception on release. Uh, perhaps predictably, it was banned in France at first, uh, and then received, uh, but however, received with great acclaim 
at film festivals around the world in 1966-7, especially in New York and various festivals uh, that year in those cities. Uh, and indeed in 1967, uh, Battle of Prologers was awarded three Oscar nominations. Uh, it's only fair to say that subsequently the film was uh, shown legally in France. Uh, two unique features of the Battle of Algiers uh, as a text. Uh, it does not simply blame the former colonial power for all the uh, faults in the uh, system. And uh, it has remained, perhaps most shockingly of all, this film has remained a horribly prescient commentary on the politics of post-colonialism ever since. And this frame is almost the final shot of the whole film. Joyous, surging crowds, sensing their imminent final evolution into a new and independent nation, almost overwhelm the police and the army. The, this exhausting final moments are very memorable. In the street, a policeman shouts through a megaphone towards the crowd, wreathed in dust from days of rioting and disruption. He shouts, go home, what do you want? The reply is a collective, a chorus, independence, our pride, our freedom. These three terms, independence, pride, freedom, are concepts that would not have been alien to those Americans who, over 240 years ago, mounted a revolution against the mighty colonial power of Great Britain and, like the Algerians, won. So, here's a picture of me. This is Nick Scudamore saying goodbye to you. I very much hope you enjoyed viewing Battle of Algiers and that you continue to enjoy this masterpiece of political filmmaking as much as I do and for as long as I have. Thank you very much. Keep safe. Stay well. Goodbye.